since the gamers from 30 to 50 years old make about the third of all gamers in the world, it's quite probable that you have played old console games. Most of them had no character development systems, strictly linear levels, no difficult moral choices and only one ending. And, of course, no way to save your game process. Later, the ability to save your game without external hardware made a gameplay revolution. The ability to save the game for a player is a way to strengthen his position in the game and from it logically follows the ability to increase the main character's stats during the game and equip him. Also, save game option ensured player's safety and allowed to play the game in an infinite number of sessions instead of one. These factors predictably stimulated the growth of game worlds. This big world for a player to conquer concept has successfully worked for three decades and will probably work for three decades more. But now we're talking about the old games with no save options. What made us start the game over and over again, fighting the inner anger and boredom of constant iterations, striving for hours with another nasty place to pass? To explain it, we need to look into the concept of eye candy in early console games. I haven't done any massive public research, but analyzing the behavior of my friendly gamers and myself, I can tell that we were playing those nasty games to find out what comes next. By that we consciously meant visual objects and how they behave, and subconsciously how they sound and what graphics and music surrounded them. These objects could actually be any objects, but most desired of them were enemies, animated props, weapons, vehicles and animals to ride. That's because they had a distinct behavior. Also, it could be the levels themselves with their graphics or music. But why did we eager to face those? Well, I think that the answer is in the pixel art. Traditional drawn animation requires very accurate outlines with plenty of details for each frame. The outlines are so time-consuming that the animators have to neglect complex coloring, shadowing and adding volume to animated objects. The pixel art in the opposite doesn't provide the ability to make complex outlines and a lot of details. It operates with roughly shaped objects with few noticeable details, so pixel artists strongly rely on proportions. But that's not all. To make objects interesting, pixel animators use all these artistic techniques that traditional animators don't. Rife coloring, pleasing shadows and a nice feel of volume. Summing up, we have this very pleasing visual style with not too much of well thought out details, vivid colors, nice shadows and highly readable volume. This is the style that a lot of modern designers are striving to achieve. It looks really attractive, but even a little child can relate to it, unlike complicated pieces of art. This kind of art is highly eye-pleasing and takes no effort to enjoy it. Beautifully crafted animations, sound effects, surroundings and background music double the effect. In sci-fi or fantasy games, well-made animated pixel object makes us feel surprise and admiration at the same time. And there we got an eye candy from the world of video games. This was the main reason for our endless attempts to advance further in the game. Having said this, let's move on to the game that got this eye candy concept and improved it accordingly to modern game standards. Its name is Maldita Castilla, it pulsates with game magic and, besides all the advantages, it's completely free. I'm aware of existence of a paid expanded version of this game, Maldita Castilla EX, but today we'll look into free one. That's because of a really fascinating way of getting it. The magic starts to happen straight on the developer's website. Besides of Maldita Castilla, you can download plenty of high quality old fashioned games made by Loco Malito and his friends for no charge. Also, for each game you can download additional materials like full game soundtracks, awesome manuals, art books and other cool stuff. Getting a game at Loco Malito's page feels like being presented by a kind wizard. But know this, if you admire Maldita Castilla, you can buy a copy of Maldita Castilla EX to support Loco Malito or donate as much as you want directly from his website. So what is Maldita Castilla? It is an old-school intense platformer 
highly inspired by Ghosts and Goblins series with pretty high difficulty and no ability to save the game process. This one and a half hour long adventure takes place in dark fantasy middle ages and sometimes gets pretty violent and filled with satanic symbolism. I don't admire these kind of things, especially in a cartoony platformer, so I won't show you any more of these. What I do admire is its superb pixel art style. Loco Malito, who is responsible for all the graphics and coding in the game, said that he had done this game in his spare time from his primary job and his family life and that his job wasn't connected with game development. Which is very surprising, because this man definitely knows how to pixel art. Just look at this. Loco Malito not only contemplated the concept of a pixel eye candy, but developed it to a whole new level. The game's world shines with its gloomy but saturated visuals. The first thing you'll notice is the color palette. From the very start of the game you'll enjoy awesome rich colors of enemies and environments upon a dark sky. This vivid colors over black background combo works most of the time, but in Maldita Castilla you can see a true talent of managing colors in pixel art. It took me a couple of dozens of replays to master the game and take all the footage, but each time I was excited to return to this magnifying colorful realm. Now let's look at the main eye candies of Maldita Castilla. More than a half of local foes were visually brought to perfection. Look at these spirits and skull bats. They truly belong to this big detail and noticeable volume art style. These are nice pixel zombies. Behold, the dancing skeletons ignite and explode, scattering tiny spinning bones all around. The dragons in Maldita Castilla look insidious and twitch and swirl with an odd grace. Even spiked logs have a cool unique touch to them. And this is probably the most fascinating enemy death animation in pixel games history. There are plenty of things to watch in the game, I won't name them all. Another thing Loco Malito got really well is a traditional game design concept. All the game can be roughly split into a number of situations with their unique problems and solutions. Like in old console platformers, the most effective way of completing the game is exploring the solutions for each problem, finding the ones that fit you, memorizing and mastering them. Solutions involve player's behavior, choice of weapon and bonus item, and managing time since it counts back and a player will lose a life and be thrown to the beginning of a level if it reaches zero. Even the most infuriating moments become easy if you know how to manage them. And that makes the game process enjoyable and somehow alike the real life. But Maldita Castilla is a creation of two people. The other one, Grisor87, is responsible for all the sounds and music in it. I couldn't figure out about his other works besides cooperating with Loco Malito, since the most of the information about him is in Spanish, which is a shame, because he has a really strong grasp of what he does. I would describe sounds and music in the game as low-key but sophisticated. Unlike most of modern pixel art games, Maldita Castilla doesn't use lots of nasty 8-bit-like sounds and catchy synths based on a square waveform. Everything in the game sounds modest and somehow reminds of real sounds and music instruments. It is definitely a sign of mastery when a sound design has its distinctive style and doesn't follow any trends. The music in the game is melodically and rhythmically complicated, more complicated than soundtracks in plenty of big successful games, especially pixel ones. It uses peculiar scales and harmonies with a lot of dissonant notes, frequent modulations, odd meters and unexpected cadences. Abstracting from the eye candy and other concepts, Maldita Castilla illustrates how effective a tiny development team could be. The game process feels very tight and stripped out of unnecessary elements. All the game situations are thought out and most of them are memorable. But the game doesn't feel hollow, not at all. It's loaded with different beloved features from the old days. You've most likely already noticed the boss fights. Try them if you want, the only thing I'll say is that they're numerous and well made according to all the classical principles. Besides the bosses, there are several unique enemies to be met in the game only once, which is really surprising for a game made by two men. Look at this nice lizard! Also, Maldita Castilla has several endings and some of them can be achieved in pretty strange ways. 
At some point of the game you'll find out that to move further you need to have a number of diamond tiers scattered across the stages earlier or otherwise your journey ends right there. Most of the tiers lay open on the levels, but some of them are really well hidden. Of course, these aren't the only secrets. The developers hid a plenty of lesser ones too. Some of them could be picked up and even assist on your quest, and some are purely aesthetical eye candies. There are more nostalgic things to face. For example, look at this stage map, or at the opening cutscene, which traditionally starts before entering the main menu. And at these awesome treasure levels, like you know where. Overall, I can say that Maldita Castilla is so good that the only reason for me to resent is some tainted infernal aesthetics in the last stages of the game. If you miss good old platformers with no save option, give it a try. It's free, remember? It's time to formulate the magic spell of the game. It is hit a rock of the game with a pickaxe over and over and gather your gold of colorful forms. Thank you for coming by, stay tuned, there's more game magic to come.